All right, thanks everyone for joining us again. Uh, today our guest is Mohan Koo. As DTEX co-founder and CTO, Mohan's passion for enabling transparency and security in the enterprise, along with his commitment to driving customer success has enabled DTEX to become recognized as one of Gartner's cool vendors. And this was in 2016. Uh, with over 20 years of global experience, Mohan is widely recognized as a thought leader in the cybersecurity industry. With particular interest in the intersection between surveillance and privacy, Mohan led DTEX to become the first ever security vendor to implement privacy by design in the development of the DTEX technology platform. Mohan is continually studying the global enterprise security landscape with a passion for driving people-centric security practices and positioning the end user as the ultimate key to enterprise security. All right, thanks for joining us today, Mohan. Thank you, Darius. So uh, for the listeners out there, generally folks are, are, are based in this in US time zones, but Mohan was nice enough to join us from Adelaide. Appreciate you. What time is it there? It is now 8.30 in the morning, so it's a very reasonable hour. Okay, so you had your coffee already. <laughs> I've had two already. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay, Mohan, so I want to base our conversation as it relates to DTEX in the industry and the pain point that you all found when you sought out to establish uh, DTEX in the security space. So we'd love to learn more about how you thought about this product would, would be perfect for this particular market and, per and serve this particular pain point. Yeah, for sure. DTEX is very focused on human behavior and, and how human behavior contributes to cybersecurity risk. And so that's what we've been built on. In the early days of DTEX, it was really trying to find a way to detect bad behaviors as early as possible. And if you wind the clock back to the start of the cybersecurity landscape, if you like, everyone was trying to scramble to to piece together what happened after the fact mm -hmm. if something went wrong or if someone stole something or something got leaked out after the fact then how quickly can we piece together the evidence to actually figure out what went wrong and and try and catch someone or piece together the evidence to to prosecute someone and that really today that's definitely not good enough and even yeah. if you wind the clock back five ten years ago it was all about being able to detect in real time so you can not after the horse is bolted yeah. you know horse is bolting even to know when the horse is bolting is not good enough because unless you've got your lasso and you're ready to go and and and, and catch the horse as he's bolting out the door that's also too late so you know where we started to find the intersection with ai is when we started to learn that in order to be able to prevent a breach you need to be able to predict what's going to happen next. If you know that A has happened and B has happened and then followed by C, mm -hmm. then you should be able to predict with some kind of likelihood that either D, E or F is going to take place next. So instead of waiting for D, E or F to take place, let's go back to C and decide what we want to do to prepare ourselves for D, E or F or to stop D, E or F from taking place. And really that's where we're at in our business right now is where we're able to look at human. We've seen these behaviors take place. We know with almost a certain degree of certainty that something bad is about to happen. And then the organization can then choose. Do we want to take surveillance of this individual to to actually track what they're doing and see exactly how they're doing it? Do we want to learn from what they're doing? Or do we want to not take that risk and we just want to cut it off right now and we want to you know, quarantine the device or cut the user off from the network or cut them off from the organization entirely? And so that's where we've gotten to with our business. And that's where we intersected with AI, if you like. Okay. I think generally when folks think about cybersecurity, it's more towards the outsider threats. And is it that your approach is to protect the organization from insider threats or even third parties? vendors that you may be working with. Is that more along the lines of where you all are playing? Yeah, so that's a really good question, Darius, because for us, we consider an insider to be anyone that's inside the network or anybody that's taken access to something that they shouldn't have access to within the, the confines of, of the corporate environment or the government environment. I guess over the last kind of 10 to 15 years in cybersecurity, everyone has been focused on protecting the perimeter, stopping the bad guys from getting in. I, I spent a lot of time talking to people outside of the cybersecurity field as well and trying to educate them. And one of the things that I, I always come back to is hackers don't hack computers. 
hackers hack people, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> hackers, hackers are looking for vulnerabilities in people and that's how they get in. And once they get in, we treat them as an insider, whether they've hijacked a legitimate user's account and they're moving laterally across the network or whatever the case may be, we treat them as an insider. When you say insider threat, lots of people just think of the malicious insider with the hoodie on, but actually we do catch malicious insiders, but it's much more about the mistakes that people make every day, the mistakes that you and I make every day. It doesn't matter how good you are at cybersecurity, you're a human being, you are going to make mistakes. And the question is, when you make that mistake, how is it going to impact the business? Is it going to create a vulnerability that will let an outside actor come into the network or come into my systems? Or is it just going to result in a leak that happens because I had an unencrypted USB that I left on the right. train? Whatever the case may be. So there's a big breadth of risk when we talk about the insider threat and trying to get people to understand that is, is pretty important. And then when we get into where we're at right now, and particularly here in Australia, I know it's the same thing in the US and some of the other countries where we're on high alert for nation state actor attacks, right? Mm -hmm. So when you start thinking about foreign interference or foreign influence in our companies, in our government agencies, in our universities, it's a complex problem because for DTEX, for many years, we focused on the insider threat, looking at protecting a single organization. We have customers that are Fortune 500 organizations or government agencies or even universities, but we're generally looking at one organization at a time and trying to help them protect themselves from the vulnerabilities caused by the mistakes that their people make or potentially malicious actors and finding them out and prosecuting them or stopping people from getting onto the network that shouldn't be there. But now when you talk about the nation state type attack, you have to step back from a single organization. You have to look at an entire industry. So for example, mm -hmm. critical infrastructure is obviously at risk. And critical infrastructure involves our telecommunications providers, it involves mm -hmm. our banks, it involves our energy providers, etc. And generally, if you're thinking about a nation state attack, they're not going to be looking at attacking one single organization. They're going to look at infiltrating the entire economy. They're going to try and infiltrate all of the key critical infrastructure organizations and potentially plant malware inside those organizations that are just going to sit there and wait. And then they're going to wait for the right time and then they're going to switch something on and who knows what that something's going right. to be. Right. And so we have to be much more aware at a much broader level where we can work with a cluster of organizations and understand what behaviors might be happening across those to find things that are unusual, to find the outliers of behavior that are common across those different organizations to then be able to say, hey, we're seeing some behavior across the industry here, which looks abnormal and looks suspicious let's investigate that further across the spectrum. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. You know, and what I'm curious about is, let's have a conversation about where AI steps in here. You gave us a preface that, look, if A and B happens, then AI is gonna help us predict what C, D, and E are gonna be, so we can step in there and nip it at the bud, right, before it gets, before anything too crazy yeah. happens. So, we'd love to understand, and correct me if there's more to it, I think that's a very uh, general way to describe it. Where I want to go is to understand what the AI is doing. And then beyond that, there's obviously this data that you need to train your AI to be able to recognize historical patterns in order to predict malicious behavior. So we'd love more basis in that perspective. Yeah, for sure. So the first place that I always start is with the data itself. We spent a lot of time making sure that we're collecting the right data. So while we are in the field of cybersecurity and cyber is our specialization and we have a strong pedigree in cybersecurity, we're actually a data science company. And what we do is the first thing, the first part of what we do as a business is collect the right data. So we've developed what we call smart forwarders or smart collectors, which get deployed across every computer system in an organization, user endpoints, server endpoints, and all kinds of operating systems. And we're collecting a very specific type of metadata, which is clean. And when I say clean, it means at source, we're filtering out any noise that's gonna be useless in the analysis portion of what we do. Okay. So the, the unfortunate thing about most organizations today, the data sources that they're collecting and dealing with are extremely noisy. Right. If you're talking about endpoint data, for example, usually you're co collecting, let's say, Windows event log, 
80 to 90% of the actual data that's collected from Windows event log is completely useless. Right? Yeah. If you're doing packet capture from the network side, 99% of that data is completely useless. You, you can never use it for anything useful, right? So our philosophy is if that's the case, why are you even collecting it? Because once you collect it, you need to store it. Mm -hmm. And after you store it, you need to clean it. And then you need to flatten the data. And then you need to cross correlate it with other data sources. And by the time you actually start doing any data science, you've spent so much effort on the cleanup process that by the time you're at the starting line, you're already exhausted. <laughs> what we've done is we've developed our own collectors to go and get the right data and trim out any of that noise at source. So when you have a set that's very well structured and it's clean, it means that you don't need AI and you don't need machine learning to do the cleanup because mm -hmm. it's already been done. So that's the first piece. And so what that's enabled us to do to find the malicious behaviors and the basic anomalies and the outliers is basic statistical analysis. We haven't needed to do anything deep on the machine learning side to be able to pull out and, and provide pretty immediate value to the customers based around statistical analysis. But where it starts to get more complicated is where you start to do the predictive analysis. And when you start to go down the route of the kind of nation state attacks, which are much more organized, they're not single individuals conducting single events that might be creating risk to the environment from their individual activities. You're now starting to talk about a group of actors, right. potentially outsiders plus insiders working together in some kind of a social network. So what we're trying to do now, and this is where AI and machine learning really comes into play, is we're looking to apply social network analysis to understand insider threats. That then brings up the whole question mark of, do we have the right training data to do supervised learning? Do we have the labeled ground truth examples that we need to do that supervised learning with that correct kind of training data? Or is it preferable to go and do unsupervised learning just to do the anomaly detection right. and the outlook detection kind of stuff to see what insider threats are? But that social network analysis is really adding a whole layer of complexity, which generally what we're trying to do is, or in the past, what we've been doing is using machine learning or AI to accelerate what our humans are already doing. So if a human is capable of looking at data and assessing the data and analyzing the data and going, oh, okay, I can see this is bad happening over there, then we can train uh, machine learning models to actually go and, and automate that. That's pretty standard kind of use of machine learning, right? But when you start looking at this kind of social network analysis as one example of what we're doing, and we're doing this with a number of defense agencies, this, is, this becomes quite complex. And this is where we think the AI is really gonna move the needle forward in a big way. Yeah, very interesting. So if I'm understanding properly, the way you're using AI to date is that some of the things that you're doing from the insider threat, the single person threats that may occur, you can predict what's going to happen in the future based on past experience. You could do that with humans, but because of the data that you've collected, because of the number of examples that you have, you're able to do that leveraging AI, which is very interesting because similar in, in data science and machine learning, there's just a shortage of talent in cybersecurity. And so sure. most organizations run into the issue that, look, we would love to, to have more people to throw at this issue, but there aren't enough people that have the skill set to actually do it. So to then right. to be able to layer AI and it allows you, allows your customers uh, to be more efficient in terms of protecting the organization and from insider threats from your perspective. But then as you move into the next phase, right, you're thinking about attacks from nation states. Now there's this whole other data set that you get to pull from in terms of social media activity, which very interesting in terms of, as you mentioned before, there was data that you knew you could identify that helped you with your original issue. But then social media, you have this boom of data. Mm -hmm. How do you identify what's important as it relates to a, a nation state attack when social media is all over the place? So very yeah. interested in how you approach that particular issue. It's not just to do with social media, because if you've got a group of actors working together, it could be insiders inside one organization, or it could be insiders across multiple organizations that have been tasked with the same activity, right? For example, they've been asked to get the plans for specific 
facilities and specific industrial control systems and find out how those specific industrial control systems are connected to the network and where could they possibly infiltrate to get malware into those systems to be able to be ready to hijack those industrial control systems if you're talking about critical infrastructure organizations. And they might do that across multiple companies, right? So Mm -hmm. we might be looking for similarities of patterns of behavior while they're doing reconnaissance on those networks. And so we're looking for, first of all, are we seeing similar patterns of behavior that's deemed unusual and suspicious? That's Mm -hmm. number one. And then can we use social network analysis to see, are they engaging with each other? Do they have any way of communicating with each other? A simple way might be, do they communicate via email? Do they communicate via via Slack? Mm -hmm. But then you could actually go out and we work with and engage with other organizations, which do the full social media network analysis to see how are they connected in the wild world of the internet? Is there any kind of suspicious that we can draw between all of these individuals that are demonstrating the same suspicious behavior inside these types of organizations? And it gets pretty complex from there. Very interesting. So I'm curious, you as a co-founder, when you started the company, no one has AI from day one. As you thought about building out AI capabilities in the organization itself, what was the approach from the first version of the product perspective? And then how did you acquire the talent to be able to build out AI systems? Yeah. So that's a really, that's a really interesting question because I think COVID has really changed the game quite a lot too. Mm -hmm. So look, we are a Silicon Valley company. We're Silicon Valley headquartered. And like most Silicon Valley companies that are VC backed, the board of directors has always wanted and and believed that it needs to be Silicon Valley headquartered. We need our key talent in the Bay Area. That's a common kind of approach and a common kind of mentality. But for a number of years, we found it very hard to hire the right data scientists. And we've had some amazing data scientists that we've hired out of Google and all the cool places. And sometimes you all you need really is a three bedroom home that you want built. But some of these guys can come back and say, well, no, you don't want a three bedroom home. I'm going to build you the skyscraper. <laughs> it's beautiful. And it may be beautiful, but if that's not what the customer is looking for, at the end of the day, we're running a business. You need to have the right kind of code built around the product to deliver the solution that the customer needs today, not what they're going to need in 10 years time, because in 10 years, the landscape could change and they might not even want a skyscraper then. And so we've gone through those kinds of iterations in the data science field of understanding a it's very hard to hire the right people in the Bay Area because they're very sought after. And for years, we've already thought we've got to go, like you, further afield than Silicon Valley and and maybe even in the US to be able to find these people. And one of the reasons why I recently moved back to Australia and moved back to Adelaide here is to be right next to the Australian Institute of Machine Learning. Because inside there, we have the access to all different kinds of data scientists from juniors all the way up to seniors and expert people where we can work together in partnership with them and grow and scale the team up and down as we need to deliver the requirements. Now, we still have our core engineering team up in the Bay Area, and we probably always will have, but we do now see that the playing field from a geography perspective has been leveled. Being a security company, we still have to be very mindful Mm. about where we hire the people from. But particularly Australia is a good location because Australia is generally trusted by most nations and certainly very trusted by the US and by the UK, which are two very key markets for us. And so now I think our board, as as well as most other Silicon Valley boards, are also realizing the same thing. If we can hire in Adelaide, Australia, for a fraction of the price that it costs us to hire a data scientist in Silicon Valley, and we get the same work ethic, and they can deliver the same quality of product at the end of the day, why are we restricting ourselves as to where we're hiring for these individuals? Everyone's working from home now. As long as you have an organization that can interact really well digitally, and I think if your company can't do that today, you're dead in the water anyway, the playing field is leveled. So hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, no, no, it's very helpful. And I think there was an insight that you threw in there that I want to make sure we don't miss because as we build AI applications for folks, it is a common issue that can happen if it goes unchecked. And that's, look, you have this really talented, let's just say a data scientist, right, with this ridiculous skill set, and they have this grandiose vision of what could be built. 
and they build for what could be built. But as the business owner, you have to be mindful of, well, what do we need to deliver right now? I'm glad you could build me an empire, but really I just need a bed to sleep in. And it plays into a lot of costs because it costs to build and deploy these applications. I can't just set it and forget it and be like, hey, in three months, come back to me with, with something. It's not going to be anything that you originally planned. So there has yeah. to be that layer of, all right, let me funnel that talent that you have in the best way that's going to serve the product Correct. that we need to deliver and at the cost that we need to produce it at. Correct. My CEO, Barman Marble, one of the top kind of engineers in cybersecurity coming out of Silicon Valley, he always says to me, just make sure we're not doing a science project. We're not here to do science projects. And I see a lot of AI startups coming out that are doing some pretty cool, bleeding edge stuff. But I'm, I'm always looking back at them and going, but how are you going to sell? Where's the market for this right now? Where's the customers? Are they coming and buying this stuff from you? Because if not, it's a great science project, but where, where are you going to go with this? Yeah. For us, as a commercial organization that has to live and die by our customers, right? Balance of pushing the edge mm -hmm. to be at the front of the game and to know that when push comes to shove, you can spin on a dime to do these new things that need to be done when things shift and change. But at the same time, you have a very focused roadmap. You know what the priorities are. You've collated all those priorities across your customer group. And you know that this is what we have to deliver first. And then this is what we have to deliver second. And you have that discipline of delivery. And it's only if something really left the field comes in and you have to pivot the business. And today, the ones who couldn't pivot quick enough, a lot of them are gone. Like I, I look at some really cool Silicon Valley companies, some of the best, brightest that are just falling away right now where you know people are leaving in droves. That they're, they're doing these massive layoffs because... They just couldn't pivot the business quick enough to catch up. Mm -hmm. So that nimbleness and that discipline is, is critical, I think. Yeah. I also want to touch on one more thing about data. You know, I think data scientists have a very specific skill set, but they don't necessarily know what a cybersecurity specialist knows. And you mentioned that you were able to weed through all of the mess of data. I'm just going to call it a mess of data to find yeah. the unique insights or the unique pieces of data that are going to be valuable for the predictions that you yourself are making or your organization is making. How did you come to that realization? And then did you have to marry some expertise between the cybersecurity specialist and the data scientist to be able to continuously pinpoint the right pieces of information that you're going to need to make the proper predictions at a high enough accuracy rate? That's a tremendous question and very complex, right? Because we actually had to bring not only two, but three kind of disciplines together. So when we first started out on this journey, we thought we, we would take the same approach that everyone else has taken, which is let's use what data is already there, right? Let's and reinvent the wheel. Let's use what data is already there to answer these tough questions and, and find the malicious actors and, and find the mistakes and the anomalies. But when you start looking at that mess of data, what you said, it's, it's an exact, it's an accurate description. It's a mess of data. And once we started looking at that, we realized we couldn't work with it. And so we had to develop our own collector first to go and collect the right data. So that required developers that were very experienced at the OS level, right? Windows developers, Mac OS developers, Linux developers, because we needed to work across you know every large enterprise has all those different operating systems so we had to have a collector that could go and get the data that we needed and then we had to figure out how to filter out the noise at source to really trim down and only bring back what was useful for us to run our analytics so it was a multidisciplinary kind of an approach that we had to bring together right at the start to get that collector and it's not easy because when you're dealing with the endpoint it's very easy to corrupt systems and create blue screens and conflict with other applications and stuff like that. So we needed the best and the brightest in that combined with the data scientists, combined with the cybersecurity experts. So that was the discipline that we had to bring together is those three groups to work as a one tight knit community to be able to develop and, and, and scale that out. And on the data source thing, the unfortunate thing for us at the start of this journey was most organizations had adopted this approach of, more data is better. So let's create a data lake. Every bank 
created their own data lake. So they brought every bit of data they could and they made a data lake in Hadoop or whatever they, mm -hmm. they did. Right? <laughs> and, and then they layer something in front of it, either Elastic or, or Splunk or whatever they put in front of it as their big data aggregation and visualization tool. And it was just a mess. So what comes out of that mess of data is a mess of alerts. Right. Now, in security, your team is looking for those alerts. And the idea is an alert is supposed to tell you when something bad is happening that you need to act upon. But what has actually happened in the industry is because of the mess of data, there's a mess of alerts coming out and most of them are false positives. What the security operations center analysts have had to do over time is not become experts at receiving an alert and taking a business action. They've had to become experts on receiving a false positive and then triaging it to figure out if it's a true positive or not. And so most of the time goes into triage now and yes. it's a complete waste of time. So when you're a big organization, you're just having to add more and more eyes on glass, more and more yeah. eyes on glass to solve the problem. So what we're doing with AI and ML is reducing the amount of eyes on glass that are needed to reduce the overhead to manage the security infrastructure and to manage the security operation. Yeah, and um, that's directly to a business issue. Yeah. If I have an analyst who's responding to all of these alerts, 90% of the alerts, I, I think at some point you just start thinking all the alerts are BS, right? And mm. so it sounds like you all, by reducing the number of false positives, the person can approach their job in a way that they feel like it's more productive. It reminds me of my days in sales where it's, look, if I got 100 leads and I know 90% of them are crap, I'm going to go into my day not excited. But if I've got 100 leads and I know 90% of them are amazing, I'm going to be way more excited on every single call because I can actually do my yep. job. I'm curious, as you all talk to clients, are there specific metrics um, around ROI, maybe from that perspective or some other metrics that you use, where it really drives home the value that you're creating in the organization? Yeah, actually we do. If I carry on from that last story, that'll bridge into your question really nicely, right? Because after having that mess of data in a data lake and trying to feed it through some system, whatever that system is, and our preferred system is Splunk, right? Like we, we have a very strong relationship with Splunk because it really is a good front end. But if you're feeding it with this mess of data, what the only thing that come out of it can come out of it is a mess. But if you feed it with the right data, then you know, all the things that pop out of it, like you said, the analyst goes from being someone who rocks up in the morning, sits down at their laptop and they go, all right, here we go. I'm just <laughs> going to spend my day diving back down into these alerts and triaging them. And maybe after going through a hundred alerts, I'm going to find one true positive that I can finally go and surface to the business and say, hey guys, I'm doing my job really well. I found this alert. It's real. Go act upon it. Right now, if you could say to that analyst, and this is what we're doing together with Splunk right now, is if you can say to that analyst, you're not going to have to do that anymore. Because what we're going to say to you is, what are you hunting for? If you know what you're hunting for, then you should be able to reverse engineer that process and say, I want to hunt for that with the smallest possible amount of data, with the fewest amount of data sources that I can to get to the problem quicker. Because once you do that, then instead of going through a hundred to find one that's real, every one of them should be real and every one of them should be actionable. So me as the analyst, I, my, my importance in the company goes up immediately right. because now instead of servicing one incident per day, I'm servicing tens of incidents per day and I'm becoming the kind of analyst that is engaging with the business frequently. So I'm actually going, okay, this is a serious situation. I need to call HR or I need to call legal, right? We feel like somebody's account has been hijacked. We've seen this behavior that they've act accessed command prompt three times in the last hour and we've never seen them access command prompt before. That's unusual. We don't think it's this human being, right? Mm -hmm. And then now they've got to go and decide who am I engaging with across the business? And then they get more visibility across the business. They become much more important in their role to the company. And that delivers job satisfaction for the security analysts rather than being right. a, you know, a, a bogged down in data person. Yeah, That's where the right data set is the most important thing. And then how you layer the analytics, whether it's basic statistical analysis or ML and AI across the top of that, we're making people more important. We're making them more efficient so that they can do more important things for the business. 
Very interesting. Yeah, and that really speaks to the productivity that AI is bringing to this particular space. Now, you've gained a number of experiences since starting from day one. Across all those experiences that you had, if you could you know, be an advisor to yourself when you started the business at day mm-hmm. one, what are maybe one of the two things that you would say, all right, you're gonna have a lot of learning lessons, but here are the two things I'm gonna tell you to save you a ton of time. The very first thing that pops into my mind is choose your customers wisely. (laughs) Because as an entrepreneur that's starting out a business, you just want to talk to anyone who's prepared to listen, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this guy was really interested in what I had to say. I'm going to close a deal there. And then you realize after many years and you look back in hindsight, you say, that was a mistake because you especially in the game that we're in cybersecurity and and AI and machine learning and stuff like this, right? There's only so many people that really truly understand it, Mm -hmm. but there's enough of them out there that really truly do understand it and realize the problem that they're facing and know that they need a new way of approaching the situation in order to truly solve the problem. But the by and large, the, the majority of people will follow, they don't lead. So if I was talking to my old self, I would say, go and find the leaders, the early adopters of technology and have realized that the, the legacy way of doing things is broken, right? Continually buying point solutions to plug point problems across an enterprise till you're left with this mess of data from all these point solutions that never designed to speak to each other. That is a wrong approach. We need a platform approach. We need an approach where the vendors that are truly leading the way are interacting together. They're developing their products in alignment with each other so that they can talk to each other and they can integrate seamlessly. Because if they don't integrate seamlessly, we're going to have a mess. Mm -hmm. And we have over the last, you know, I would say three years or so, we have really honed in on those organizations that understand that the old model is broken and that they need a new model and they need new data. That mess of data can no longer be our holy grail. We cannot live and die by a mess of data. We need clean data and we need a clean system that can deliver that data to us in the way that we want to see it. And that's why I keep mentioning Splunk because they do that better than anybody else. And so at the end of the day, that for me is the biggest learning because you can kiss a lot of frogs, but if you can kiss less frogs to get a higher uh, rate of return, that's the best outcome because you're saving yourself time and you're being more focused and you can grow the business a lot quicker. Yeah, no, very interesting insight there. And and to your point, as a startup, it's look, who's willing to write us a check? (laughs) But that may work in the beginning, but getting to that ideal customer, developing that avatar as quickly as possible. Sounds like yeah. it saves you a ton of headaches. It does. And when you build the customer as an advocate, especially if they're quite clever and quite sophisticated as an individual, mm-hmm. then they automatically, without you having to say anything to them, they start promoting what you're doing with them because they've helped you build it and it's delivering value to the business. They tell their friends. Okay. And that is worth one customer being your salesperson is worth 10 salespeople in the field. Oh yeah. That's third, that's third party validation right there. You can't beat that, (laughs) especially if it's a reputable customer. That's right. Awesome. Awesome. That's all we have for today. Definitely appreciate you coming on. I learned a lot today. I'm sure everyone else learned a lot today as well. And we'll have to have you back sometime soon. Fantastic. Darius, thank you very much for having me. All right. Talk to you soon, Mo. Take care. Bye-bye.